off of you for you to get started. Welcome everyone, this is an amazingly big crowd. I just started back at the National Museum at the beginning of January. This is the most people I've seen all month, and I'm so happy, I love all of you guys. Like, yay! <laughs> so my name is Alyssa Gidry, I'm the new Curator of Education and Public Programs here at the Master Museum. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here with us today, especially considering today is um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's a very important day. Um, <clears throat> the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau um, concentration camps. On this annual day of commemoration, the UN urges every member state to honor the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust and millions of other victims of Nazism. So thank you so much, so, uh, sorry, Jackie. Call me Saul. <laughs> Jackie, for coming here to talk about your father, Saul. Call me Saul. A lot of people call me Mr. Saul. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Saul, I'm not calling I also want to thank our sponsors for exhibition that's upstairs, the Toby House exhibition. Gotta make sure I get that out of the way, the Louisiana Endowment uh, for the Humanities. They uh, do generously donated a lot of money for us to be able to get this, uh, this exhibition all the way up from Alexandria and for all of this programming that accompanies it. So we're very, very thankful to have that grant money. Um, it is an honor to welcome our guest speaker, Jackie Rosenberg. Jackie is the president of Saul's Pipe and Steel in Monroe. His father, Saul Rosenberg, was born February 2nd, 1926. He passed away January 30th, 2009. He was a Polish-American businessman and philanthropist. Jewish-American. Jewish-American. Oh, Forget about the Polish. He was a Jewish <laughs> survivor of the German Nazi concentration camps who became an industrialist in Monroe where they established Saul's Pipe and Steel Company. Um, Jackie is here to speak about his father's experience during the Holocaust and reference the book Saul's Story, A Triumph of the Human Spirit, uh, written by Dr. Richard B. Charkoff, a former ULM historian. South American history historian. <laughs> <laughs> South American history to European history. That's that's another story by itself. So we have some more folks coming up. Oh. Gene Adrian. Hey, how you doing? All right, let's go on up, my man. Thanks for coming. Y'all got enough room? Yeah, we got we got we got a few more coming. Oh, you have a few more? Yes. Are they coming? Are they walking in the door? Uh, it's a pass. It's, it's my wife. Okay. Oh, okay. Joseph. It's my wife, so you never know, Jackie. <laughs> Her mother. I'm not saying anything. Chairs for these folks. Yeah, I, I warned you about this. <laughs> I warned you. I think we've got some more room in here. We can squeeze some more in this room. They should be standing up. You can move some up to the front over here. Susie doesn't bite, please. I'll scoot over. No, I don't bite. Especially uh, friends and family, um, all you folks in here, really appreciate it. It means a lot, not only to me, uh, but my family as well. And also, too, I would like to thank Evelyn Stewart. Uh, she's not here. Uh, she and her husband, Arthur, are delayed somewhere. Alyssa Gidry, I also appreciate her and the Master Museum for inviting me to speak to you about my father, Saul Rosenberg, and his book, Saul's Story. It's truly an honor and privilege to be here tonight. Also, you know, we're in conjunction with uh, Theo Tobias's uh, amazing art that was obviously influenced by the Holocaust. And of course, you know, as Alyssa mentioned, it's uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, this day, January the 27th, 1945, is when Auschwitz concentration camp was liberated 
uh, by the Russians, and um, um, it's, tr it's truly a historic occasion. So, a lot to, lot to start talking about. But before I talk, start talking about my father's story, I need to mention how the book came to be written. My father would speak on this day, Holocaust Remembrance Day, we call it Yom HaShoah uh, in Hebrew, and his experiences at our synagogue. And Dr. Richard Chalkoff, who was a South American history professor at ULM, became interested in his story. Well, my father asked him if we'd be open to writing a book about his experiences during the war. And Dr. Chalkoff, he was some mild-mannered fellow, said really he was not an expert in European history, but he was open to the idea. So shortly thereafter, the doctor got a grant from ULM to visit all six concentration camps that my father was interred in, and also Warsaw, where my father grew up. And those visits gave the doctor not only a geographical fix, but a chronological fix on the events that my father would describe to him later on during the writing of the book. And, the, and he was ready to start writing at that point. He would come over to my parents' house in the evening, and my father would speak to him literally for hours and hours and what he endured during that dark period that we know as the Holocaust. Now, what was the Holocaust? The Holocaust was the systematic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. It was the most horrific crime of the 20th century. The Holocaust is a Greek word, and it means sacrifice by fire. For me, the Holocaust is a very personal thing and not just a word. The people that died as well as those that survived, such as my parents, were real people with real hopes and aspirations. Each one was a unique individual and a precious soul who had hopes and it was part of the family, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother. Each one worked, played, lived, and did all the ordinary things of life. They were all part of the Jewish people and each one was murdered. An entire culture had existed for hundreds of years and was lost forever. The Nazis who came to power in Germany during 1933 believed they were racially superior and the Jews were deemed inferior and a dangerous threat to the German people. Both my parents, Saul and Tola, were born in Poland. My mother's memories were obviously terrible and prevented her from speaking about them. When my brothers and sisters and I were growing up in Monroe, there was not a lot of discussion about the war. I believe that both my parents wanted us to grow up like normal American kids and didn't want to disturb us. As time went by and we all grew up, my father felt that he had the duty to start speaking about his experiences due to the, in the war, and especially when David Duke, who was an American uh, Klansman and an American Nazi, ran for governor of Louisiana. He felt, that was it, I gotta start talking, I gotta start talking. Anyway, he was born in 1926 in Warsaw, and his parents <coughs> had a bakery that provided a modest living for them. Saul and his two sisters, name, his father's name was Floyd, and his mother's name was Haya, his older sister was Franya, and his little sister was Tupcha. And my father was a very athletic, active young man, participating and excelling in many sports. When he was not quite 13, the Nazis invaded Poland on September the 1st, 1939. After that, his whole world was turned upside down. The Nazis rounded up all the Jews in Warsaw and the surrounding areas and placed them in an area called the ghetto. Now, the ghetto, was a part of Warsaw that was about the size of the French Quarter. You can imagine uh, the French Quarter and how large that is. And it was surrounded by a high wall about 12 feet tall. And it separated, uh, the, the ghetto was separated from the rest of the city, which was non-Jewish. By 1942, the population of the Jewish ghetto had grown to approximately 500,000 people. His family, as well as the rest of the ghetto, endured terrible hardships and had very little to eat. Starvation and disease were rampant in the ghetto, and the dead bodies, especially the very young and old, were a common sight on the streets. At night, when it was safer, my father would go over the wall to barter for food and other necessities for his family. If he had been caught, he surely would have been killed. In June of 1941, when Germany invaded Russia, the Nazis sent out murder squads called Einsatzgruppen, these were special SS squads sent specifically to murder the Jews of Eastern Europe and Russia. They would round up all the Jews in a village and bring them to a deep ravine or ditch and have the local militia shoot the men, women, and children, 
one at a time. Over one and a half million Jews were murdered this way. But for the Nazis, this was not good enough. This was not efficient enough, and by January 1942, the Nazis came up with the final solution. Now, what was the final solution? It was the creation of a system of concentration camps in Germany and Poland, where the Jews would be gassed in chambers using rat poison, Cyclone B, I think they called it, or carbon monoxide, and they were burned up in ovens called crematorium to get rid of the evidence. This was organized and prosecuted by the most elite troops called the SS on an industrial scale using cattle cars to bring the Jews from every corner of Europe. And the Jews were told they were being resettled in the East. They were even given food at the train station in order to entice them. My father's family was taken to the station one by one until one day when he came home to an empty house and he realized that he was all alone. He did not realize yet that they had been taken to Treblinka, which was a death camp built 40 miles from Warsaw. Eventually, he too was captured and taken to the train station and taken to Treblinka. When he got there, it was cold and close to Christmas. He ran into a friend of his, I think his name was Monik, who was collecting luggage for the Nazis. And his friend told him to start doing the same thing he was doing. And my father said, what is that? He said, don't worry, just do the same thing I'm doing. After all the people were off the train, he found out from his friend that they were all going to be gassed and burned up in the ovens. After unloading the cars for two days, he and his friend decided they were going to escape Treblinka. Later that night, when the Ukrainian guards were drinking and carrying on, my father and his friend got in the back of a cattle car and hid till morning. The morning came and the guards closed the doors and the train headed back to Warsaw to pick up more Jews to bring them back to Treblinka. Before they arrived back in Warsaw, my father and his friends jumped from the train and decided to split up to reduce the chance that they would be caught. When he got back to Warsaw, one of his friends brought him to a young leader of the resistance in the Warsaw ghetto. His name was Mordecai Analoitz, and he and other young men and women were planning to resist the Nazis, and he told my father that they would die with honor fighting rather than being taken by the Nazis and slaughtered like sheep. When the fighting started in March of 1943, my father, who was about 16 years old at the time, whose job was to go down to the streets after any Germans were killed to gather up their weapons and ammunition for the resistance fighters. After the first skirmish, when the Molotov cocktails burned up some German half-tracks, my father brought back a German helmet. He scratched the swastika off and drew a Star of David on it. He thought they had won the war. Unfortunately, the Nazis brought in tanks and planes and destroyed the ghetto completely, killing thousands of ghetto fighters. My father and some of the other survivors went into the sewers, and it was there that it was flushed out by tear, tear gas and dogs. When he got to the top of the street, the German soldiers told him to sit on the ground, and he sat on the ground, and the German soldiers started killing the older uh, leaders, the ones that maybe had leather jackets and watches on, I guess they thought they were leaders or something. And uh, they came up to my father and they asked my father how many Germans he had killed. And he said, my father who spoke German very well, told him that he didn't kill any Germans, that uh, he was a young boy and he didn't kill any Germans. And the, the German soldier, he said he was about maybe 18 years old, sprayed the ground in front of him with his machine gun, dirt, and, gravel and everything was flying up. He thought he was a dead man. But, uh, but for some reason, the German didn't kill him. So he and the other survivors were rounded up in cattle cars, taken to Majdanek. Now, Majdanek was a terrible death camp and work camp south of Warsaw. And there, he was literally beaten and nearly starved to death. He told me that Majdanek was the worst of the six right there. He, he didn't think he was going to make it out of there. But as the war went on in the Eastern Front, the Russians were steadily pushing the Germans back to the Polish border. Due to this, he and the other survivors of Madonic were sent to another camp to the west called Chestatova. Now, he managed to survive this camp as well by using his wits and his strong desire to live. There was an instance once when two SS doctors drove up in a big black Mercedes. He never liked Mercedes after that, I promise you that. <laughs> and the men were told to line up in two lines to be examined. My father had been wearing wooden Dutch shoes and his feet were very bloody. Uh, when one of the doctors looked at his feet, 
he motioned my father to the left. And my father knew by this time what that meant. That meant to go to the gas chamber. So he kind of wandered around one of the buildings, found some old bricks that he could wipe the dust onto his bloody feet, came back to the other line and told the other doctor in German, because he could speak a little German, that he could work hard for the Germans and he was a strong boy. The doctor looked at him and motioned him to the right. Now how a 16 year old could react that quickly was one of the reasons he survived the war. His faith in God and his will to survive was truly a triumph of the human spirit. As the war progressed for the Allies and the Russians continued to push the Germans back on the Eastern Front, the Nazis retreated back to Germany and spent precious resources and troops and trains to bring the Jews back to the concentration camps in Germany. Listen, they were losing the war, they knew they were losing the war, and they were still obsessed about killing the Jews. Uh, it's just unbelievable. The first camp he came to in Germany was Buchenwald. From there, he was shipped to Flossenburg, another camp, and from Flossenburg, he endured a terrible death march to Dachau concentration camp. Now, Dachau was just outside of Munich and was the first concentration camp in Germany. And the first thing he saw there were piles of dead corpses, dead bodies that had been gassed and not cremated. In fact, they had snow on top of them. They'd been there that long. In order to survive, he had disguised himself as a non-Jewish Pole and on his jacket, he had the name Stash Yashinsky. And after witnessing the misery and death at Dachau, he wondered if he too was going to end up like those corpses. After being in Dachau for about two days, on April the 29th, 1945, units of the 7th U.S. Army broke through the gates of Dachau, and they completely surprised the Nazi guards. When the Americans called out for all the Jewish prisoners to come to the front, my father took off his jacket and told his Polish inmates that his name was not Stasiuszynski, that his real name was Saul Rosenberg, and that he was a Jew. <laughs> At this time, he weighed about 68 pounds and was literally a walking skeleton. He was nursed back to health by the U.S. Army, and it was not too long after that that he met my mother, Toa, at a displaced persons camp. They were married on November the 11th, Veterans Day, 1945, and in the beginning, they were going to immigrate to Israel, but because of the War of Independence there in 1948, my mother and my brother Joe were not able to go. They instead decided to immigrate to America. <coughs> they arrived in New Orleans by boat in December of 1949. And from there, they were sent to Monroe by train. And there's a story about that. When they got to Monroe, uh, my, my father told me that uh, he got out of the train and started looking in the streets. And the conductor asked him what he was doing looking around like that. And he said, well, he was told there was money in the streets in America. <laughs> <laughs> the conductor looked at him and said, uh, son, boy, whatever, uh, there's no money in the streets, but what you will find is an opportunity to make a living for you and your family over here. And I'm sure you didn't have that over there. Anyway, uh, my father had lots of stories. And one of the stories he told me is that the boys in the camp and they would lay there in bed, you know, starving to death, literally. And they would talk about their dreams and their hopes if they survived the war. And my father said his first dream was to have a whole loaf of bread by himself. <laughs> he said his second dream was to meet and marry a beautiful blonde. And his third would be to come to America. And you know what? He achieved all three of his dreams. Well, I hope I haven't spoken too long, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. And thank you for being such a gracious audience. Thank you. Thank you. I know there's lots of questions. I know there's lots of questions. There always is. You know? So I'm glad to answer them. I'm sure some of you have questions. I have a question. Ladies first. <laughs> um, when the Germans first started feeling the way that they did, towards the Jews yes. and ultimately doing uh, what they did. What led up to that? Like, what were the signs, the beginning signs of that? Well, anti-Semitism, which means hatred of the Jews, had existed for thousands of years. And not just hundreds of years, but thousands of years. And uh, why Adolf Hitler you know, felt this way, there's lots of theories about that. Lots of theories about, you know, 
being mentally unstable was one of them, but uh, he was, there was also jealousy involved. Uh, when he was uh, a poor, starving painter in Venice um, before the war, uh, he would, uh, and Venice was a very international city and had lots of successful Jewish merchants, Dr. Sigmund Freud, you know, and uh, he would, uh, and he was out there trying to do paintings of houses. He was a house painter. He would paint houses, you know. Not literally paint a house, but pictures of houses. And he would see these uh, wealthy, wealthy Jewish merchants and doctors and gentlemen in their fine cars and coaches. And uh, they say that was part of it. Uh, also, too, uh, uh, they say there was some mental illness in his family. Mm -hmm. uh, his father's, uh, when his father was sick and a family doctor in Austria, I guess that, that's where he was from. He wasn't from Germany, he was in Austria. And his real name was not Hitler, it was Schickelberger. And they said there was mental illness in the family too. But uh, as, as time went on, uh, he felt that the socialists and the Jews, who were a lot of socialists, Karl Marx, you know, were responsible for the Germans losing World War I. And they, they had stabbed the German people in the back. And also, they were a convenient scapegoat for the Germans' problems, you know. And you, you, know, mm -hmm. and it, you know, you tell a big lie long enough, yeah. over and over and over, and people are going to tend to believe it. So he started these things in the 20s, but he didn't achieve power until 1933. But even from 33 to when the war started, you had a whole generation of young Germans indoctrinated in this. So when it came time, to shoot a Jew, you know, uh, they believed that they were subhuman, and that's just how they were brought up. It'd be interesting to know how they're teaching that in German schools now. You mentioned they, that before. They are teaching time. about the Holocaust now. Now, what's interesting about that is that in this country, in this country, less than half the states are allowing their high school students to be taught about the Holocaust. They're teaching about the World War II, but not about the Holocaust you know, that in this country. And you talk about anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semitism right. is still here in this country, but there's some insidious uh, ways of displaying it. And now they don't say they're uh, against Jews, but they say they're against Israel or Zionism or whatever, which is another word for being an anti-Semite. Sure. You know? And this is occurring not only here in this country, you know, by the Klan or whoever, but also in our nation's capital and some by elected U.S. officials, too, right, right now, right now. Yes, sir. I've toured Dachau three times. It's so extremely interesting. The last time was two and a half years ago, and there's three words on the Iron Gate, and I don't know how to pronounce Arbach it. Arbach Machre. Can you say it again? Arbach Machre means work makes you free. It's a cruel uh, play on words for the people there because the work that they did there, the lucky ones, that were able to work like my father, uh, certainly didn't make them free. But there, yeah, that was on the t that was written across the top of all the country. Abach macht frei. In fact, uh, you know, one of the aims of uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were to make uh, Europe what they call Juden Jew free. They called it Juden frei, you know? and, and they made some areas Jew free too. Achieve it. In fact, in his diary, the day before he committed suicide, that was one of the things he wrote about that he was proud about, that he almost or practically wiped out European Jewry. The Nazis killed six million of the nine million Jews that were here. They killed two out of three. One and a half million of that six million were children. Were children. Yes, ma'am. Uh, could I add, add something? Also, you have to keep in mind the world, Europe was like the United States, they were in a depression. Right. If there were 550,000 Jews in the population of Germany. That's right. And uh, also, Hitler was able, oddly enough, to use the German courts to achieve his goal. Uh, when Mr. Ernest Strauss was a student at the University of Heidelberg, a professor called him in to his office and said, you need to pack your suitcase and go home. They don't want you here. Listen, there was a ship called the St. Louis. It left Germany in the late 30s. 
with 800 some odd Jewish people. They were gonna immigrate to America. This country refused that ship to be unloaded. This country and many other countries did too. And My family finally- was on that ship. Yeah, I can, I can oh. attest to that. I'm sorry? My family was on that ship. I can attest to that. Are you kidding? He said to Australia, yeah. Wow. 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 <laughs> anyway, most of them ended up going back to Europe. I think, you know, uh, England got a couple hundred, France a couple hundred, and some other countries, Holland, whatever. Belgium took a, a little bit, but most of those people ended up being murdered by the Nazis. But the, in this country, there was a depression going on, and uh, the government felt that uh, if they started letting people from these other countries come in, that they would make it harder on Americans. And, uh, but that needs to be known. That did happen. Okay. That did happen. Yes, sir. Are you aware that there were Jehovah's in Dachau? That oh, yes. Oh, because yes. Because they wouldn't pledge the Nazis and women be Jews. You're right. You're right. I, I think there were about. They were not Jewish. That's right. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Listen, there were about, if I'm not mistaken, there were about 50,000 Polish priests that were murdered in Dachau right there through the years right there. Because they were considered, you know, political, you know, uh, uh, enemies of the of the Germans right there. And in fact, Pope Paul was, uh, was was one. He wasn't murdered, but you know, he was uh, resi he resisted the Nazis too. Supposedly, a lot of gypsies were also uh, slaughtered as well. Gypsies. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Not only were Jews uh, murdered, but also gypsies, homosexuals. People of different political opinions, uh, they were also murdered there as well. Mentally, mentally retarded. And, yeah, in fact, uh, even before the concentration camps were built, Hitler and his henchmen decided that uh, mentally uh, deficient Germans should be euthanized. And uh, that would uh, um, ensure the pureness of the Aryan race, not to have mentally defect people. And many, many thousands, I forgot how many thousands, of mentally defect Germans, not Jews, Germans. And when the <coughs> population found out about that, this is in the 30s now, this is before the war. When the population, the German population found out there was a big uprising against that, and they stopped doing that. And Hitler kind of learned his lesson uh, about <coughs> killing people openly like that. And after that, he decided that his name would not be on any orders to kill Jews. He would all, always do it through his henchmen, like uh, Himmler or, or uh, Eichmann or people like that. Yeah, yeah they, and he didn't, have, he didn't want any blood on his hands, but he was the one that was ordering it, you know. But nothing was ever written down. There was never an order. But in all of his speeches, you could tell the hatred towards the Jews. And like I said, up until the very end of his diary, it was one of the things that he was proud of, that he almost wiped out European Jews. Yeah. In a bunker in Berlin where cyanide and a pistol by suicide, he and his girlfriend, Ava right. Braun. That's right. Not his girlfriend, his wife. He married right. her the night before. That's right. Yes, that's right. He married her the night before. Yeah. And that was his present to her for being loyal to him. <laughs> I'm sure there's... Yes, sir. Your, your talk is just wonderful to, to be to, to hear. I mean, I read the book and it just brought tears to my eyes to, to realize what people go through. It's just a terrible human tragedy. In your opinion, though, why is it that we need to continue to talk about this, continue to have these kind of conversations? Well, I think there's Especially a, in this country. Yes, yeah, there's a reason, there's a reason for now, you know, the uh, Yom HaShoah or the, you know, Holocaust Remembrance Day is once a year. And, you know, it's not something that you want to bring up every day. But we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. <coughs> In fact, there's a famous phrase uh, for Holocaust survivors and second generation Holocaust survivors, because there's very few Holocaust survivors that are still alive now. And those two words are never again. Mm -hmm. Never again. And believe it, genocide is going on right now, somewhere in many places in the world as we speak right now. And I don't have to talk about Rwanda, Bosnia and places like that, uh, there's plenty of that going on right now as we speak. And, um, uh, you know, racism and, and genocide are
are terrible things, and we need to overcome. Hopefully, we've overcome this in, in this country. My father first came here, he worked at a furniture warehouse downtown, and uh, he was young, he was, you know, like, you know, somewhere around 24, 25 years old, and uh, he would uh, play checkers with a, a black gentleman who worked also for this furniture company. Well, one day, you know, after lunch break was over, one of the supervisors came up to him and said, uh, uh, Saul, I know you're not from this country, but you're not supposed to be playing checkers with that boy over there. And he didn't use the word boy, he used another word. Mm -hmm. My father said, well, why? You know, he's a nice guy and he's nice to me. And uh, I like playing checkers with him. And he said, well, we don't do that in this country. Mm -hmm. And that was his introduction into racism in this country. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we've overcome that mm -hmm. by now. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but we do need to remember these things. And it's not something, like I said, you want to bring up every day or every hour. It's, and it's too much, you know. But we do need to remember these things happen so that they won't happen again. Because if you don't know about these things and they start to happen, then you're more likely to let it occur again. And unfortunately, like I said before, these things are not being taught in all the classrooms, even in this country. Even in this country. They still need to be yeah. everywhere. Yes, sir. As your dad was telling the story, at, I guess at your house, were you listening? Oh, um, yeah. He now, he, listening again, he, he waited a long time no, yeah. about him finally. Right. He didn't tell it for a while. No, tell a long that. time. A long yeah. time. Now, he wouldn't talk about it. When we were young, he wouldn't talk about it. But if something really tra traumatic happened, or it was something that really jolted him, uh, he would bring up an instance, you know, of, you know and, and a name would blurt out, like Berkowitz or something like that, you know. Well, who was Berkowitz, you know? And, then, and he would, you know, tell us what this guy did, you know, terrible things, you know. In fact, my father couldn't, even to the doctor, even in this book, couldn't write down all the terrible things that he witnessed. First of all, it was too, it was too hard for him to put on paper, and second of all, you couldn't read it. It was just too horrible to read. It was just too horrific like that. And again, again, we you know we were normal kids growing up in America and we were, you know, going to school and playing sports and they didn't want us to be disturbed. But like I said, later on, 